Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. I hope everyone can hear me. Um, time is money for everyone, so I should just uh, to start on time. Welcome to all the participants. My name is Davy Maas, working for the Chamber of Commerce in West Flanders and your moderator um, of today. We have the pleasure to welcome more than 25 private companies. Uh, of which 25% um, is within the IT sector and the telecommunications sector. 15%, uh, around 15% provide business and financial services, and more than 20% are in the construction or machinery sector. So a diverse public today. The objective of our meeting today is to present the key objectives uh, of the match project and to um, explore how companies can to relaunch their economic activities despite a bleak economic context. Recruiting the right sets of skills is, fu is fully part of the solution. More than ever, digitalization and new technologies are central to rapid economic growth and to organize work more efficiently. Activating and upskilling the current Belgian population will be a key step but will certainly no longer be sufficient for our economy to run at maximum speed in the medium term. We need to broaden our horizon and explore ways to employ qualified talents from non-European countries. As you might be aware, the MATCH project has been developed by the IOM, International Organization of Migration, which is an UN agency and the program is funded by the European Commission. IOM and its partners launched the MATCH project in January 2020 and here in Belgium uh, the program is implemented by um, yeah, three other partners, uh, VOCA, which I'm from, Agoria and Vidya B. The project aims at enabling companies to fill their manpower gaps by recruiting highly skilled talents from Nigeria and Senegal. Here we see the agenda for today. Um, first, we will introduce the webinar by a presentation from um, our colleague Hendrik de Munk from Via B. He will uh, highlight the key features uh, of the Belgian labor market and present us the risks and opportunities in a post COVID uh, crisis. Afterwards, uh, Jurin Fransen from Agoria will look at the impact of digitalization and the current skills gap in Belgium. And this session will be followed by a detailed presentation by Rob de Lobel, head of the unit at IOM, explaining how the match project can be a solution to the skills gap and help companies to be ahead of the game. We also will hear uh, Mr. Cedric Filet, the CEO of Aldelia, and he will focus on how to achieve high quality recruitment in Nigeria and Senegal for a wide and diversity of profiles and talk you through the possibility of distance working arrangements. So if there are any questions during the presentation, please do not hesitate to ask them in the general chat. We will follow up on them and answer them accordingly. Um, but I suggest that we uh, will start now and I'm happy to give the floor to Hendrik for uh, his presentation. Uh, thank you, Davy. Um, you can go to the slide. Um, I'm Henrik from VDAB. I'm going to tell you a little bit about uh, labor market shortages um, in Flanders and Belgium. Um, Davy, can you mute yourself, maybe? Because I think, thank you very much. Um, so, um, first of all, I want to show you the evolution of the available job seekers uh, per open vacancies uh, we have in Flanders. Uh, if we look uh, to the last years, we see a strong decline in the amount of job seekers that are available uh, per open vacancy. Um, last year, there were less than four uh, job seekers per open vacancy. That's low. And uh, if you know that there, there are big differences between uh, professions, there are professions that, that, that have more than 100 job seekers per open vacancy um, uh, in comparison with uh, jobs that are less than one person uh, job seeker uh, per open vacancy. Um, yearly, we make uh, a list, uh, we do an analysis, yes, Nelson? Uh, we do an analysis uh, of the shortage occupations uh, with VDRB. Um, and if we look to them, 
And then in 2020, we see that 120 of the 186 um, shortage occupations were for STEM profiles. Um, yes. Thank you. Um, yeah, you can go further. So, and if we see um, uh, eight out of 10 of the top 10 um, of shortage occupations were STEM professions. Uh, we see the same in 2019 and the same the same in 2018. This um, a lot of the professions where uh, our structural um, shortage occupations are in the STEM region, the science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. Um, for example, I'm going to show you some uh, professions in uh, IT. If we go further and we look to the IT, we see in IT a lot of uh, profession bottleneck professions, um, and we see that all of them, yes, um, are quantitative um, shortage occupation. That means that there are not enough people uh, to apply for the job available with companies. Uh, and next to it is not only e even if there are uh, job seekers, a lot of them don't have the right competences to fulfill these jobs. Um, and if we go back uh, in the studies uh, last the past years, 2019, 2018, and I could go further, uh, yes, um, in time, um, these professions are structural bottleneck professions. Every year they are on that list of short occupations uh, in Flanders. And uh, we see the same um, in, in Brussels or Wallonia, these IT professions are uh, structural bottleneck professions. And even if we look further abroad uh, to the countries next to us, Germany, the Netherlands, uh, France, Spain, um, these professions are really um, structural. Um, it's structural, a structural problem to find the right people for these kind of jobs. And I could make the same slide for some uh, jobs in constructions or uh, in the industry. We have a set of jobs that are uh, year after year uh, uh, that have uh, there are problems to find the right people for these uh, jobs. Yes, Nelson, you can go through. Yeah, you can go through the next slide. Now, uh, now we have an impact. We have a crisis that we've never seen before. Uh, before, and and of course it has an impact on the uh, labor market. If we see on the job seekers, uh, the blue line uh, is the evolution of the job seekers, and um, the red line is the prognosis we made in January. Um, what would be the expected evolution of job seekers? Um, and the blue line uh, from March and especially uh, April and May, we uh, see a strong increase in amount of job seekers we have at the moment. Um, and that is before um, the uh, in the next months we will see the, the a further increase uh, with the uh, um, young people that leave uh, the educational system and uh, enter the labor market. Also on the vacancies, yes. Uh, also on the vacancies, we see we see a strong impact. Um, if we compare the last three months, March, April, and May, um, from this year 2020 in red uh, against the last year 2019, then we see uh, a strong uh, decline of amount of received vacancies uh, that VDAB had. Um, so the uh, crisis had a direct impact on our labor markets. Um, but if we going to look a little bit further on the on the, uh, uh, the next years and uh, the prognosis um, they make, yes, Nelson. Then we'll see that the that the next years, uh, this year and next year, there will be a massive jobs loss. Uh, around 100,000 jobs uh, are expected uh, to be lost, um, and of course, the unemployment uh, uh, rate will be uh, increased the next two years. But if we go look a little bit further, then we'll see from 2022 already that there is again an increase in jobs um, and a decrease in uh, unemployment rate. And it's important to know that the jobs that will be lost the next two years will not be the same jobs that will be, um, will be created uh, after 2021, that will be different jobs. It's not uh, something that we can just put uh, people who uh, now got unemployed in the crisis, put on the jobs that will come in the future. Yes. If we combine this with some, some demographic trends in Belgium, then we'll see um, that in the next 15 to 20 years, um, the uh, labor market population uh, will decline. So there are more people um, leaving the labor market um, than entering. I think it's around 100, per, uh, 100 uh, persons that leave the labor market 
only 80 to 82 people will be entering the next uh, 10 to 20 years. Um, to put this in a uh, to put it in numbers, uh, yes, uh, Nelson. To put it in numbers, um, from 2018 to uh, 2028, uh, we see that there are 750,000 people who are leaving the labor market um, and should be replaced. And the, this amount is a, a lot bigger than we've seen the last years. Um, if we uh, take into account that there are some yes some other uh, ongoing evolutions like um, everything um, like blockchain, big data, uh, machine learning, all the digital transformation of the labor market um, with things like industry 4.0. Yes, Nelson? Um, we can conclude that even the next years, um, yes, uh, the next years uh, for a lot of professions that were already a structural, a structural um, labor market shortage, um, it will be the same. That um, for the, uh, for example, in IT, um, in construction, some uh, professions in the industry, um, it will be uh, not easy for companies to find the right persons. So it is uh, worthwhile uh, already to um, to look further abroad to uh, see where you can find talents to fill these gaps on this uh, in our on our uh, Belgium labor market. Uh, this is very short what I wanted to tell uh, from VDAB. Um, so I think a project like Match can be uh, 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 valuable because um, at this moment, it seems like, okay, with the crisis, there, was, there is some uh, extra oxygen to our labor market, but it's uh, very short term. And uh, I think it's important that we um, stay on track to uh, look to other talents uh, further abroad, uh, even than Europe. So, Davy, back to you. Okay, thank you very much for this uh, insights and the view uh, on the labor market. Um, I think if there are any questions, there are also a Q&A after the, the three presentations. So, go ahead uh, or also put them in the um, general chat function. Um, do not hesitate, like Rob just mentioned in the chat. Um, so thank you again, Hendrik. And now I'm very pleased to announce Jeroen Fransen. He's a project leader of Be The Change project with Ahoria. Since several years, um, he does research uh, regarding the future of world, the future of our labor market and the impact of digitalization and technology on our labor market and uh, the skills and uh, everything um, within this topic. Um, I think, Jeroen, you are the right person to ask you what the impact of digitalization will be on or is uh, on our Belgian labor market. Could you uh, please explain this a little bit more? Okay, thank you, Davy, for the introduction. Um, Hendrik focused on an overview of the actual situation uh, on the Belgian labor market. My work is rather oriented to uh, the next 10 years. Uh, the work is called Be the Change, and we analyzed what the specific impact indeed uh, of digitalization on Belgian labor market between 2020 and 2030 will, uh, will look like. And mainly, uh, we see two uh, important macroeconomic evolutions. Uh, as Hendrik also mentioned, uh, one is a quantitative uh, evolution. The other one is a qualitative evolution. Let me start with the quantitative one. Um, we predict, and it's it's not me, it's the National Bank of Belgium and several European sources, we predict that there will be an average annual growth in the next 10 years, an average annual growth of the labor demand of 0.9% every year all sectors uh, together. So it's an average. There are, of course, several sectors growing at faster pace, other sectors perhaps uh, in decline. Um, so that's important to know. The average labor market demand will grow by 0.9. Of course, uh, COVID um, causes uh, a negative impact on labor market in the next uh, 18 to, uh, to 24 months. As uh, as Hendrik also mentioned, but the latest numbers um, 
and some deduction exercise state that the average will stay uh, between 0.8 and 0.9 uh, per year. Um, sectors with high demand are healthcare, education, services, and ICT. And it's not specifically the ICT sector as such that will grow at fast pace, but it's the digital experts in ICT sectors, but also in all the other uh, sectors. In the, in the, in, in the, on the long run, uh, over the next 10 years, and, and Hendrik showed a pretty good uh, slide on that, supply of labor, uh, labor force will be stable. We predict a slight growth for the next uh, 10 years. Uh, so I know that Hendrik's numbers were negative, but we see a positive impact of migration and, um, and lengthening the, the careers. Uh, so the, 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 the pension age will, will, get, uh, will get higher. But we need to keep in mind for this project that there will be a growth of the demand of 0.9 and there will only be a growth of the supply of 0.3. So we're in front of a, a, a really important uh, paradigm shift on Belgian labor market. Uh, for the first time in our history, in two years, let's say, the demand for labor will be more important than the supply we have in our country. The second point, uh, after the quantitative perspective, there's also a qualitative perspective. And that says that the content of every job will change. So digital skills will be key in the development of new roles we will see on the, the labor market. And those uh, skills will not only uh, be linked to the digital expert, but digital expertise will be needed in every applied uh, or in every field of application. So those are mainly the, the, two, uh, the two macroeconomic evolutions we have to really keep in mind. Okay, thank you. Digitalization will have a positive impact also uh, on the yeah, on our labor market. Um, I hear you saying um, it's not because everything will be digitalized that we won't need um, employees anymore uh, let's uh, say that um, maybe another question then what do you think uh, for the belgian labor market or, or, or labor market what will be the main challenges and opportunities you see ahead in the next um, years yep so um we noted four four big uh, uh big challenges for belgian labor market uh one specifically related to the to this project let me start with the upskilling exercise. Uh, 4.5 million Belgian professionals will need to keep their uh, or to, to get their digital skills up uh, up to level, and they will need to keep them up to level in the next 10 years. Um, that will be a huge uh, first challenge for uh, Belgian professionals. Um, we have to be honest. We have to tell the brutal job truth. For 310,000 people this uh, this upskilling will not be enough. Um, we have to face it, 310,000 people in Belgium will lose their jobs in the next 10 years because they hold a profile that will no longer be in demand. So for this group, we will need to, to, to coach them towards another track um, from a disappearing job towards a job in higher uh, demand. But even if we keep these groups of people relevant, and if we keep them on the labor market, even in that situation, we will lack 584,000 people between now and 2030. We will be unable to fulfill the demand of 584,000 uh, jobs. And if the first two um, uh, strategies or, or challenges for upskilling and retraining. Uh, of course, the third one in that, uh, in that regard is activation. We will need to get more people active on Belgian labor market. And we think we will be able to activate more or less 270,000 people 
between now and 2030. Um, this includes, uh, this also might include uh, smart migration uh, uh, methods. And the fourth strategy, and this may this might surprise you uh, a little bit. Uh, fourth strategy is that, that we have to uh, focus on efficiency and implementation of technology to kill even more jobs. Not, Davy, to, 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 to kill your job or to kill mine, but to get the dull tasks out of our work, get the repetitive tasks out of our work, to get the dangerous tasks uh, out of our work. And we think that from the one side, we should activate more or less 270,000 people. From the other side, we should avoid the need of plus minus 200,000 people between now and 2030 using uh, specific new technologies, but let's be aware that we will need specialists to implement those new technologies. Most of them are, are digital, digital technologies, of course, um, but there are also other drivers of change, such as sustainability, for instance. Okay, this is uh, digitalization is to help more jobs, actually, to help doing our job in the future also. Um, economic migration um, also to, to um, yeah the, the skills gap or the gap that there is um, to mitigate the, that gap um, we will need economic migration I are you saying you because the activation of our Belgian employees or non-active people nowadays will not be enough so I think that's a really interesting um, sentence. So you talked um, at the last point regarding the sustainability. Um, what do you think? How can uh, our labor market become more sustainable by the end of um, 2030? Um, I think that uh, an increase of diversity and increase of agility uh, will be will be needed. Of course, uh, we should take care of the upskilling uh, of all the professionals, and we should uh, take care of the access to Belgian labour market for everyone. Also, those with a lower skill level, and they could be assisted by uh, technological uh, colleagues. In in fact, um, but if I say two hundred and seventy thousand people to be activated. Um, I have to mention that we consider uh, that more or less 10% of them should be invited from other countries to maximize our uh, GDP, in, in, in fact. So we will need, between now and 2030, an extra 30,000 uh, people, well-skilled people, uh, coming from other countries to help us uh, grow our economy in the best uh, possible way. So that's the potential. I have to mention that there will be already uh, that we already calculated an impact of migration of 160,000 workers between now and 2030, just based on the actual measures on the actual situation, political situation in, in Europe. So we think we should fasten this up and, and increase it with more or less 30,000 well-skilled, uh, young, enthusiastic people wanting to, to help us boost our uh, economy and yet at the same time uh, keep uh, a good link to their, uh, to their own country, to have an added value there. Uh, also, because that's, that's an important uh, point of view from uh, a lot of politicians, for instance, in our country, that we should not only go and take away the, the, the added value elsewhere. There should be a continuous link with the, with the, 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 the mother country. Okay, thank you very much. I think smart migration actually and, and unlock some talents in other countries is, is a very interesting solution um, to, to fill in all our vacancies and, and yeah, to yeah, take some talent from other countries thank you very much for these insights i think um we can also read um the, the yeah the project you did with agoria be the change with some interesting facts and figures um i think now it will be also on the screen 
Um, so if you go to the link, you can um, find more information um, if needed there. So uh, thank you again, Jeroen. And uh, now I think we can go um, to Rob and Cedric, who, who will tell us something more regarding that smart migration solutions. Uh, Rob is project coordinator with IOM, and uh, Cedric is CEO and founder of Aldelia, which has uh, a great expertise on that yeah, smart migration schemes um, and also great experience in um, finding those talents for our um, companies, um, companies which do not find any yeah, relevant talent here anymore. So Rob and Cedric, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Davy. Thank you for this introduction. <clears throat> Hi, everyone. So my name is Rob. I work for the IOM office here in Brussels. And I am going to uh, talk to you about, indeed, this match project and how it connects and answers some of the questions that have been raised by uh, the previous uh, speakers. So the match project is actually a partnership between four countries, uh, two countries on the African continent and four EU member states. Uh, and obviously, today we will be focusing on the Belgian case, but uh, please note that also Luxembourg, the Netherlands and Italy are part of the project. Uh, and on the African side, we have two uh, countries, Senegal and Nigeria. Senegal being a French-speaking country and Nigeria being an English-speaking uh, country. These two African countries, they represent a huge pool of uh, qualified uh, talents. Uh, you have to know that in terms of inhabitants, the two of them together, I think, represent more or less uh, half the size, you know, of the EU. Huh? So in terms of quantity, of course, it's a, a, a huge opportunity there. Obviously, not everyone is uh, highly qualified, but I just want also to point out that indeed the pools of qualified labor in these countries are quite significant. And that's uh, the reason, or that's one of the reasons why we have engaged with these two countries uh, in particular. If we move to the next slide, I can then show you uh, how this match project actually uh, works, uh, a project that is focusing on international recruitment, on actual uh, labor migration. Uh, and you can see here that the first step is indeed that the companies on the EU side, in this case on the Belgian side, are invited to, invi uh, to uh, share with us their open vacancies. So vacancies, you know, that you find difficult to fill, vacancies for which you uh, find that there are structurally, you know, shortages in the labor market, feel free uh, to share them uh, with us. And we will then move on to the second step. <clears throat> and publish these vacancies with our partners or through our partners in both Senegal and Nigeria. So this will be done with the uh, project partners, uh, as you've known, where they are IOM and Aldelia. Uh, and as you might know, IOM, the organization for which I work, uh, we have offices also in both these African countries, and we have colleagues that will assist us uh, with this work also uh, on the African side. Once we have published the vacancies, we move to step uh, three, and we will, for you, uh, for you, the company, identify the top five matches, the top five candidates for each vacancy. Um, so if you say, I need uh, an IT specialist in uh, that area, we will try to match that request with profiles on the uh, African side. We will submit a top five to you, and within that top five, we will keep an eye on gender balance, uh, with a minimum of 30% uh, female candidates that we want to uh, guarantee. After that, step four, uh, the companies are free, of course, to finalize the recruitment process. So as a company uh, with that top five, you can decide, you know, whether you want to submit these people to tests, uh, specific tests that are maybe part of your HR processes. You can decide whether you want to interview these people. You can decide whether you do that online or whether you do that, you know, physically. All these things, you know, are up to you to decide. Eventually, it's up to you also to decide whether you would hire uh, one of these candidates or more of uh, or more than one of these candidates uh, for some of these uh, vacancies that you have uh, shared. Step five. IOM will assist you with all of this. IOM and the partners in terms of logistic preparation and in terms of preparing the candidates to actually move uh, to Belgium. 
So um, we have teams in place, we have uh, uh, trainings in place that we also use in other projects where we try to prepare these candidates for the professional environment and the cultural environment uh, here in Belgium. And if needed, um, we can assist you and your teams as well uh, with the integration of these people into uh, your companies. Now, maybe one word uh, also on this slide with regards to the corona uh, situation. Uh, so this slide, you know, shows, you know, how you can recruit internationally and fill your vacancies, you know, through the match uh, project. We are, of course, fully aware that at this stage, uh, international mobility is not allowed. And therefore, uh, within the project, we provide also some flexibility with that regard. So there is a possibility, for instance, also to start working with young African talents remotely. So that would mean that you could um, <clears throat> hire them for it on a temporary basis, for instance, uh, but for them to work remotely from Senegal or from Nigeria for you as a company uh, here in Belgium or for one of your branches, if you would have any uh, back uh, on the uh, African side. So there is quite some flexibility there. In principle, if people come over to Belgium physically, then there are a number of rules that are to be applied and uh, the new single permit. Uh, and we will, of course, also assist you, you know, with these procedures for the obtention of a visa, uh, of this permit, uh, you know, the, the, the completing of the documents, etc. Uh, as a team, as a match team, we will be available also to assist you with these uh, procedures. We move to the next slide, and here you can see what the benefits are, at least according to us, for the uh, hiring uh, company. So Nelson, I think you can list them uh, immediately. So the first one is the, the cost of this whole uh, process. Yeah? So uh, international recruitment can be a very, very expensive, uh, you know, thing to do. Um, through this project, we can minimize those costs. So the whole story that I just told about we providing you with the top five of candidates is fully free. There is no engagement from your side. There is no fee for you to pay. Um, you can decide that you will hire none of them at the end of the process. So it's up to you to, uh, to, um, to, uh, to decide on these things. And the cost for us to come up with this um, uh, top five for you is, uh, is zero. So that's, I think, uh, an interesting one. Obviously, we are looking into qualified labor. Huh? The, the previous speakers have highlighted it. So we are looking into very uh, sophisticated matching systems huh? where we will indeed screen you know cvs on the african side we will of course target specific niches in the uh, countries campuses tech hubs depending on the vacancy we will uh, look into uh, you know where we can actually find these uh, profiles so yes um, we uh, can guarantee to some extent uh, that this matching will be uh, adequate uh, as said uh, we want to be as flexible as possible eh? so we want to adapt also to the needs that might exist at the level of uh, the companies um, so uh, we are flexible on the duration eh, of the job placement but the idea is that the companies start with a fixed term contract that could be nine months that could be one year that could be two years really depending on the needs of the, of the company um, and there is some flexibility uh, with regards to these uh, contract durations uh, and the same, of course, for the distance working arrangements. Yeah? So uh, you can say, well, maybe we can start working from a distance for the first six months, and then we invite the individual to come over physically if that would be allowed under the corona restrictions uh, by then, of course. Then uh, we will, of course, help you uh, uh, work on the diversity uh, at the workplace. Yeah? So a lot of companies indeed, you know, have a policy related to diversity in the workplace. And we are happy to assist you with the uh, implementation of that. And finally, uh, and, we, uh, and we think this is an important one as well, because we've seen it uh, also in previous similar projects, that it's a, a great opportunity for uh, uh, companies also to discover the potential of Africa. Um, hiring, you know, some of these individuals, working with them, getting to, you know, uh, feel and see how qualified uh, they are and probably open doors, I think, also with regards to the potential uh, of Africa. It's important also, I think, from the perspective of, you know, being a front runner, being a pioneer, as uh, you know, the previous speaker just highlighted. Um, in the next uh, 10 years, there will be an increasing demand uh, for labor. And so testing these kind of international recruitment schemes, I think, 
uh, is an interesting first step, you know, uh, for opening up to this possibility of uh, international recruitment. So that's definitely also, I think, uh, the idea here with the, the match project. Moving on to the next slide, what is expected from you uh, as an employer? Eh? Because, of course, there's uh, uh, some expectations of us also with regards to uh, the role of the, the companies. So the first one here is uh, related to the employment conditions, and that's actually uh, part of the legal framework. Eh? So the Belgian legal framework foresees that for qualified labor, you need indeed to pay the individual uh, a, a market-conform uh, salary. Uh, these numbers are, you know, uh, uh, put on paper, eh? so you, 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 you have a low margin there, you need to pay these people a decent uh, salary. And obviously we would want you to employ uh, the, uh, the young talents uh, on the basis of the actual vacancy that you shared with us. Um, so that's uh, pretty straightforward, but still important to mention. If we move to the next uh, expectation, <clears throat> and Nelson, I think you can put them all on the screen. We, in, we, of course, expect you to invest in human capital. Eh? So this is kind of a skills mobility scheme as well. So uh, the idea is indeed that you work together with these uh, uh, talented uh, Africans uh, on a number of projects, on a number of topics. And there will uh, hopefully be a lot of on-the-job training. Uh, but there could also be alternative training possibilities in the company or outside the company. So we invest you yeah, to take that seriously. Uh, and to make sure that these people are indeed, you know, uh, followed also from a, a human capital perspective once they are uh, inside uh, the company. Then we will be monitoring and assisting uh, you as well throughout the whole process. Eh? So imagine now you would hire someone for one year. We will be monitoring that process. We will be coming back to you with regular questions. How is it going? Are you satisfied? Are there any problems, etc.? And of course, we would expect you to communicate uh, any problems with us so that we can also, uh, whenever possible, uh, try to find solutions uh, with you. Um, and then, as already said, yes, uh, the soft landing of the migrants in your company, that's an important one. Eh? We can assist you with that. So we count on you also to make the integration of these people as smooth uh, as possible. Some of these people uh, will also be invited, you know, uh, to work with uh, the uh, diaspora communities that are already in Belgium. Some of them might be willing to engage, you know, in uh, development projects back in Senegal or Nigeria. And so there also, uh, together with us, we will see, you know, whether there are some initiatives coming from the workers uh, and how we can support those. Then the next slide is a slide where our partner Aldelia uh, will um, uh, say a bit more, you know, about the uh, recruitment approach. And for this, I hand the floor to uh, Sireit. Thank you, Rob. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. So I will uh, introduce you to uh, Aldelia and how we are working uh, across Africa and especially in Nigeria and uh, Senegal. So just to introduce myself in two words, I'm um, Cedric Filet, I'm the founder and CEO of Aldilia. We uh, have set up, I have set up Aldilia 15 years ago now in Europe, and we are operating in uh, 13 countries across Africa, both French, English, and Portuguese speaking countries. So in terms of the selection and how do we recruit uh, the people, it's uh, very simple, but very well organized and structured. Uh, with international practice. So we use our international database that we have across the continent um, and we work on the local people with our local team, both in Nigeria. We've been operating in Nigeria since 2009. We just celebrated our 11th anniversary in Nigeria and we've been operating three years in Senegal now. So we've got the team locally. We can find the local profile based on the shortage of skills um, you could be having. And we've talked about various sectors, ICT, uh, but also healthcare, education, but we can talk about construction, we can talk about um, customer service, banking, uh, and, and so on. There is no uh, limitation uh, on, uh, on shortage of skills, unfortunately. Uh, we do work as well with the Senegalese and Nigerian diaspora across uh, West Africa, uh, because they could be spread on in West Africa. Uh, so we've got the, the network with, with them. Um, 
I talk about the, the local uh, Senegalese and Nigerian recruitment team who recruit on a daily basis locally. We use local advertising, which is still uh, papers, radios, but also uh, obviously social networks, which working quite well. Uh, and we do some uh, local head hunting. We've developed a, a new platform as well, which is the only matching platform, Pan-African uh, job matching platform uh, on the continent um, that makes sure that we don't receive thousands of CVs on our inbox uh, where uh, we advertise or when we advertise uh, on, on social networks. So people will go on the platform, they register on the platform uh, and the platform source and through machine learning and uh, artificial intelligence will find you or we select the first uh, candidates and then we will interview so what's once, once we have identified these people these talents um, we go to the the test and the, the interview phase where we will test uh technically um, th their skills could be uh, when we talk about uh, uh, ICTs or electricity or mechanics or we can have very technical tests uh, with them could be uh, Excel could be banking could be finance could be could be anything um, and then we, we have an HR interview as well whether it's by video with uh, the limitation today uh, or face to face when when we can um, once we have assess the people uh, that's when we do the shortlist. And the shortlist is based on both technical tests and personal interviews, the HR. And then the, the CVs will be submitted um, to you guys in Europe based on your requirements. In this process, we will involve you, of course, uh, to understand what you want, what you need, uh, and what is not written on the um, on paper. So sometimes it's good to have a, um, a quick call to understand what you will be uh, looking for. If we go to the next slide, Nelson, please. This is uh, very important to us. Um, this is very generic, and this is how we recruit. Uh, fair recruitment and compliant with ethical standards. This is very important, and this is why we've been in Africa for the last 15 years, and that's why we plan, and we believe that we could stay another 15 years uh, or more. So being compliant, being ethical uh, with what we are doing, um to have everything in writing okay the word and the, the, the speaking in africa is uh, the cultural speaking is important but we put everything in, in writing we are compliant with local regulation um especially and we will talk after when we will have to uh, not only recruit but manage um, the talents so manage the contract of employment the payroll the taxes the medical insurance the pension make sure that all compliance with local regulation uh, we do zero discrimination with people on time. This is very, very important. It seems very straightforward when I say it, but it's it does, it's not the case all the time. So first, we make sure that uh, we apply this. We do due diligence on employer as well to make sure that uh, the talents we are, we are sending are not uh, going to uh, not uh, that good company. And even recently, this week, we, we had to decline uh, a job uh, because the, the client was not serious on, on, on his search, so we, we declined the job. Um, we test the, the talents as well. We can hear that in Africa sometimes or in Nigeria, um, there is lots of fake scams and so on. Yeah, yeah, the, it happens. Uh, but to, to face that, we, we've put in place some uh, online tests uh, so we can test the people before uh, we interview them. And we can select only the one who have passed the test. And if you ask me, uh, how can we make sure that, that the right people passing the test, attending the test, because we are filming these people. So they're filmed and they're recorded. So we can make sure after, once we interview them face to face, that's not the big sister who have attended the, the test. Obviously, we don't charge people and talents for, for, for the job. So this is very important. And we comply with uh, RGPD, uh, even if it's not applicable in in Africa, it's not uh, live yet, but uh, we apply this for international clients. Next slide, uh, Nelson, please. So th this next two slide, and uh, I will combine in, in, in one, um, you have um, a, a general overview of the, the, the process of recruitment. 
And uh, so you will publish the vacancy or we will publish the vacancy. We will preselect the candidates. Uh, we select the candidates. And then we will discuss about this incubation phase. Um, and the incubation phase could become a solution phase as well, uh, where, uh, Nelson, if we can go to the, to the next uh, slide, um, during this incubation phase, uh, that could happen in three different uh, contexts. You know, when um, the travel restriction with the COVID um, is uh, happened, we cannot travel, or where there is some administration delays to obtain visa, work permit, and so on. That's one. That means this incubation phase will be put in place when we cannot, or when you don't want, or you can't have the talent in Europe. So travel restriction or admin restriction. The company wants to implement remote work. So you decide to work remotely uh, with this candidate, uh, with the talent, which we can see is working more and more and more. So the talent will remain in Nigeria or in Senegal. So you will need a, a structure to, uh, to manage it. And then when the talent, after a certain period of time, will come back uh, to um, to the, his home country. So, and that's where uh, we will be there to support you, whether you have a local branch or you don't have a local branch. We will manage everything from the contract of employment uh, to the, the payroll. So taxes, medical insurance, and, and pension. So that's where we can support you in country when you have to, uh, to manage your talent locally. I try to do as short as possible, not to be told off, but happy to uh, discuss uh, on, <laughs> on the question and answers. Okay, thank you very much, Cedric and Rob. Um, maybe for Rob, I have uh, another question. What about the Dutch, uh, the speaking language? Uh, will there be, be any courses or lessons in Dutch? Yeah, that's a very good question, actually. Um, so um, I think it will depend a little bit on the case by case. So you will have maybe companies that are interested in, you know, uh, bringing over African talents for a longer period or maybe, you know, on a permanent basis. And then I think that indeed these okay. courses are, are very, very important. And so there we will have to see with uh, for Dutch Agentschap in Burgering uh, and the VDAB, you know, uh, how we can provide these uh, talents with Dutch courses. Other companies might, you know, be looking into, you know, a shorter kind of scheme. Eh? They might, for instance, have a project in Africa or a branch in Africa, and they might say, okay, I bring someone over for like, like nine months to train them, to integrate them with the company processes, etc. And then I might hire them back in Senegal or back in Nigeria. So the question would then be, is this, is this relevant also to push these people, you know, to follow uh, Dutch courses? Eh? Some of them might want to and might be interested. Others might might not think that this is uh, useful. So we will have to look also, I think, into the options and the possibilities there together with the companies. But it will depend a lot, I think, on what is the perspective of the company. If we're talking about longer term recruitment or permanent recruitment, then it's essential. If we're talking about, yes, a job placement of a short period, and then we will see eh, where this individual, you know, uh, whether this individual goes back to the country of origin and is not hired by the company, or whether it goes back to the country of origin and is maybe hired by a partner, uh, a branch of the company, etc. So we will need to look into that, uh, you know, a bit case by case. But we have good contacts with the providers of language courses, and we can, you know, of course, play a facilitating role as well. Okay, thank you for this clarification. I think it's very clear that the project match is very demand driven. So. Um, that tailor made actually, we will look into the possibilities and opportunities each time. Uh, let's have a look at our team in Belgium before we go to uh, some other questions in the Q&A. So um, we are actually a quite a broad team uh, of, of employer uh, agencies or also um, IOM, of course, but also uh, Aldelia for support for their expertise. So you can certainly um, contact us when, uh, whenever a pr problem or, or questions are arising. Um, I think we can go to the next uh, slide because there are also a website. Um, so if 
yeah, any company want to register for um, or match project that can be done uh, directly on the website, uh, that step would not create any oblig obligation from um, your site as a company, but uh, it's maybe um, useful for us to, to see and to look at the interested companies uh, to have a better view on them. Um, but I think um, I have another some questions in the Q&A. Um, on the website, besides there are also uh, our project brochure with some more information and maybe the information will be also um, go further into detail uh, regarding the two uh, chosen countries, Rob, uh, Sina and Nigeria. Why those two countries and are there any plans to broaden the countries uh, in the future? Yes, thank you, Davy. I think that's also a very good question. Eh? So why Nigeria? Why Senegal? Uh, I think there's a number of reasons. I remember at the time when we made the assessment, you know, of uh, the uh, African countries that were potential candidates, uh, there were several criteria that we looked into. Obviously, we needed uh, ideally a French-speaking and, and, and an English-speaking country yeah, because we're covering four EU member states. Um, and yes, for instance, the Netherlands, they're more interested in English speakers, while, for instance, Luxembourg, they're more interested in French speakers. Uh, so that's one. Second one was the availability of labor. Yeah? So if you look at the pools of highly qualified labor, is there, you know, a surplus in these countries? If there would not be a surplus, then we would have to go and take away you know, employees in uh, African countries, and that would, of course, create a brain drain that would create a lot of friction. That would be negative, you know, I think, to take away uh, skilled labor, you know, that is active in, these, uh, in, in, in African countries. So in both Senegal and Nigeria, we have a surplus of young people, you know, entering the labor market, being qualified, you know, uh, being entrepreneurial, being active, but not necessarily, you know, being employed, you know, uh, in, in a classical way, right? Uh, and this was for us definitely uh, uh, an important one, uh, the quantity, then the quality. We looked at the quality as well. What's the quality of the educational system? Are there, you know, relevant universities that provide uh, the, the labor market with good uh, candidates? Um, you know, the, the technology, the state of technology, the availability of tech hubs. Uh, do these things exist? Do we have access to them? Can we judge to some extent the quality? Uh, and these two countries came up, you know, as countries where there is indeed a quite dynamic, uh, you know, technology scene, uh, technology in the very broad sense uh, of, of the word. Uh, and then there were other more internal elements, I think, that played a role as well. For instance, the strength of the IOM offices uh, in these countries, the position, the experience, uh, etc. That's a number of internal things that played a role as well. Also, the donor, the European Commission, uh, wanted us to look at uh, Western Africa uh, and not necessarily this, the southern part of Africa. Uh, so there were a number of internal elements that also played a role with that. For what concerns the future? Yes, yes and no, I think. I think this is a pilot now with these two countries. Um, if this uh, is uh, interesting, if there is a, a possibility, you know, to create value for the European companies through such a scheme, then it's highly probable that these kind of scenes will be repeated uh, in the future and potentially also with other countries. You have to know that today there are already uh, some other schemes. There is a scheme, for instance, uh, between Morocco and uh, Flanders on ICT specialists. Uh, there was a scheme also uh, between uh, Tunisia and Belgium or, for interns uh, for internships. So there are a number of piloting uh, schemes that are already taking place. And the idea is really also to look into this, like from the perspective of a legal way of engaging with young Africans, right? So uh, we hear a lot in the media about irregular migration and all the problems related to that. These kind of schemes want to organize uh, the uh, migration uh, flow. You know, they want to look into what are the possibilities to set up some legal pathways. Uh, can, this benefic can this be beneficial for both the European countries, but also the countries of origin? So our hypothesis is also that a number of these Africans will have to go back to their country of origin. And not all of them will stay uh, in Belgium, and that will depend a lot on, you know, the willingness for, from companies to, to have them uh, stay. Um, so we're really looking into these legal pathways, as they call it, and we're trying to, you know, set up pilots that, you know, prove that there is an added value for the different stakeholders, and if we succeed in doing that, 
And I'm quite convinced that there will be uh, more projects like this in the future with other countries as well. Thank you, Rob, for uh, this clarification. Um, if there are any other questions, please please do not hesitate to, to ask them in the Q&A. I have another for from Cara. Um, um, if there is any specific attention uh, in the selection phase for the fact that these talents um, yeah, are not applying for a job um, yeah, next doors, but actually for a job uh, thousands of uh, kilometers away. And maybe I can take this one, uh, Davy. Uh, yes, of course, this is a very interesting question, very important because uh, people will be relocated, um, even in terms of culture. But we can see that the talents of Africa are really willing to, uh, to move, to relocate. Uh, we can see from the beginning of their studies, they travel the world to follow, to attend universities, whether they're in, in Europe or in the US. Uh, so they, they use or even to go to other countries uh, to, to get trained. We've got some Senegalese people going to uh, Cote d'Ivoire or Ghana to get to get trained as well. So it could be regional movement or uh, international. Lots are going to France to, to follow universities as well. So these kind of migration movements um they 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 used to travel and they, they are very keen to learn they are very mature very early uh, due to the, um, the their life and uh, they will be very keen to learn and to move uh, and to, to grow in europe so this is something that uh, we will uh, we'll see a uh, lot of people willing to uh, to apply for these jobs i think rob as well yeah, I just maybe want to add to that, and that's also from previous experiences, that in the recruitment process, we also need to be very uh, clear, you know, on um, uh, attracting the right uh, people, right? And it's a matter of attitude, because we've seen also in the past that some of these young Africans uh, see also this as an opportunity, you know, to get into Europe, right? More than as, you know, and invest in their own career and their own uh, CV. Uh, and we have had mismatches of people that arrived in Europe and that were not serious, you know, about uh, the job placement or not serious enough. So, for instance, in a previous project, I remember we had to send back some people after two weeks in Belgium. Um, so I want to stress as well that this is indeed also part of our job, you know, in the pre-selection to make sure that we are attracting and talking to people that are doing all of this, not as an entry ticket to Europe, but as an investment in their own career, right? that they are taking this seriously from a professional job perspective. Uh, and once they arrive, you know, invest and commit to do, you know, the best they can uh, within the company that they will be integrated in. So we are also, I think, we need to keep that in mind, that this kind of things sometimes also attract people with, you know, uh, different intentions or wrong intentions. And we need to filter those out as, as, mu as much as possible. So. Um, it's part of our job. I think the filter is never 100%, and eh? so there might always be, you know, a few cases uh, of, of where it goes wrong, uh, and it's up to us also then uh, to uh, to assist the company and make sure then that these people can be replaced or can be, you know, uh, if if it's really a bad experience, sent back, um, and and we've done that in in the past as well. So I think it's important in the pre-selection phase already to uh, make sure that the candidates that we're talking to are there, you know, uh, from a very professional perspective with the ambition of investing in their own careers uh, and in their own CV. Indeed, I think that's a very key element uh, with, uh, within this kind of project, um, actually the, the willing also to work in Europe and to, to, yeah, to adapt to the European uh, lifestyle to say, but I think Cedric also has a great uh, experience in that uh, kind. Um, so Rob, uh, maybe one follow up question. Um, it's a really demand driven project. So uh, are there any limits on um, um, finding some profiles or, or specific kind of sectors? Uh, are there limits on the sectors or profiles? No, indeed, we're open to any sectors and any profiles. Of course, as uh, Jeroen and, and uh, the VDAB has shown, there's, of course, sectors where the needs are higher than other sectors. So obviously, naturally, I think we always move to those sectors. Uh, but we're open to any sector and any type of company. So um, 
if you're not an ICT company, that's really not a problem. Uh, we can look into your uh, vacancies. We can look into the profile that you're interested in. Uh, and there's no limit uh, with that regard. With regards to the timing, we are also quite flexible. This is a, a project that will last until the end of 2022. Uh, so uh, we're not pushing anyone at this stage to start, you know, international recruitment with the COVID, with the crisis. We know that this is not uh, high on the priority list of companies. So we could explore possibilities to hire next year eh, or later. Uh, what we are trying to do today is really to have this dialogue with companies. And that's also why it's important, why we would like to invite companies that have an interest. And an interest is not a decision to hire tomorrow, but an interest in exploring this to register also on our web page. Eh? You've seen the link uh, in this uh, presentation. You find the link, uh, you know, uh, um, on the LinkedIn page where you find it when you type um, match or, or IOM Belgium. Uh, and if you register uh, in our database, then we can keep you informed and we can have also bilateral calls with you. We can provide you with more technical information on how it would work, et cetera, et cetera. So we can go into more of a bilateral conversation where we can exchange, you know, on the exact needs that you might be having and also on the timing. Thank you for this interesting information because I think yeah, indeed it's very important to have that feedback or input from the companies themselves uh, as well, so uh, an, an interest uh, mark uh, within the project is not an engagement yet, uh, of course. So um, if there are companies uh, willing to share some information with us or share some vacancies, I think that will be very interesting. Another question to um, to Rob: um, Is there any return element incorporated in uh, this match project? So after jobs are terminated, etc., and who will be responsible for that part? Yeah, excellent question once again. So indeed, uh, we need to agree with the company what the setup is. So imagine that the company says, "I'm happy to take one year, uh, one person, you know, for a period of nine months." Uh, then we need to decide, you know, at the, towards the end of these nine months, does the company want to continue with this individual eh, and add, for instance, another nine months or a longer period? Uh, or does the company say, well, uh, for me, it's been a good experience or whatever, but I don't want to continue. And then we will indeed take care of the return element. So the idea is indeed that the people uh, that engage in companies here in Belgium, uh, if the company decides not to go through with them, that we indeed accompany the individuals to go back to their country of origin. So we will also tell every candidate in Africa that in principle, this whole scheme is uh, circular. So they will come, but they're also expected to go back, right? It's only in case both the migrant and the company say, no, we want to continue together, that we can do an exception. If one of those two says no, then they go back. So the principle is really, yes, we go back and we accompany them. We will also reintegrate them back in Senegal or Nigeria. So it's not just, you know, putting them on a flight and say, well, that was it. No, our colleagues of IOM in Senegal and Nigeria will look uh, uh, together with them at possible opportunities of employment, at possible, you know, uh, people that would want to create their own company, entrepreneurship, Together with Aldelia, you know, uh, and, and their uh, teams, we will look into, you know, uh, possible other companies that are willing to hire these people back in Africa. So we will make a lot of links to our networks to make sure also that these people that are in Belgium have also a good incentive to go back uh, to Nigeria or Senegal. Ideally, we would even find a job for them, you know, back, uh, when, back in Africa. So we know, for instance, that from a previous scheme uh, with Tunisia, um, all the people that came to Belgium did not have a job when they came. Two months after their return to Tunisia, they all had a job. So in terms of employability, this is really also a, a big uh, added value of this uh, kind of scheme. These people, because of their international experience, etc., they have it easier, you know, to find a job also back in their home. Yeah, okay, thank you, Rob. So the support is not only restricted to the, the one way ticket to Belgium, of course, but uh, indeed in the um, back to the yeah 
original country as well. Um, I think uh, a question or a remark of Yuri's, uh, yeah, I think it's, it's a correct one, that they are looking always for skilled staff um, for their uh, African projects, but most of the time there is kind of problem issues with the administration with the visa requests. Um, so could the match project be used for training staff to be employed in Africa just for the training? That's absolutely a good idea. Right? That's what we typically see also in previous schemes is that companies that have activities in Africa or that have offices or projects in Africa bring in these Africans to Belgium, you know, uh, to train them on the job or formally train them, you know, with our external trainings uh, and then post them a way of back in their projects in Africa. So that's definitely a part of the aim here. And we have very good relationships with the authorities here in Belgium. They are part of this project, eh? the Flemish side for the work permit, they visit the national side for uh, the visa. Uh, so we are working closely with them and we are also going to accompany the companies with this procedure so that we speed them up. So that instead of having to wait, you know, uh, three to four months to get, you know, the paperwork done, we can try to limit that to like six to eight weeks, right? Uh, we need to go through the process, you know, it takes a bit of time, yes. But if we can limit it together, you know, by looking at things together, uh, that could potentially also be interesting and beneficial for the company. Yes, yeah, so, so the project can also uh, looking with the companies for opportunities within the legislation regarding economic migration. I think there are various opportunities of possibilities um, to, to yeah, give um, these schemes uh, of economic migration um, a little bit more form. Um, one last, no, no uh, not a last question, but what about um, yeah, if they are here uh, with the project and they find a better opportunity here in Belgium with another company, will, this, will that be a problem or not? Um, I don't know, maybe Rob or myself, I can maybe also uh, answer that. I think for the project that won't be a problem actually. The person is free, of course, to enter uh, within a, a contract, an employment contract. Um, I think um, if everything is within the legislation and um, I don't think that there's any problem. You have uh, an, a single permit for a certain period of time with a certain um, a, a employer, uh, but of course there are some ex uh, uh, um, there are some limitations on it, but also some uh, expectations um, in the legislation itself. Drop so in. Absolutely right, Davy. So what I can say is that indeed, if we agree with the company for a stay of one year, and we agree with the authorities that there is indeed a single permit for one year, then of course this comes to a term. Once this comes to a term and this person would want to go and work for another company, then this other company, I think, would have to do, you know, the administrative follow-up of having this person stay longer, having this file being accepted, etc., etc. So that will then, that most probably will not be done by the project. We will not promote mobility in Belgium, eh? so that's a bit a step too far. Uh, but that is a possibility, and I think, indeed, if this is done correctly, that could be an option also, you know, uh, companies you know to see you know who's already here and get some of these people that are already here so it's not excluded i would say but it would also that i think not be uh, promoted by the by the by the match project as such yes and with most cases the new employer will also uh, have to go with the new administrative procedure um to to request a, a single permit so it's not the ideal uh, situation of course there um, for now, the, the last question of John Paul, uh, what about the double taxation issues um, in Senegal, Nigeria? Are there any problems there or restrictions there? Um, maybe I see Cedric wants to answer that question. Yes, uh, that's a very important question as well. Uh, when the talents will be in Nigeria or in Senegal, uh, we will be responsible for their taxes. So that means um, they don't need to pay taxes in uh, in Belgium. Uh, they will be paying taxes in uh, Nigeria because they will be working physically in in Nigeria. That will be their uh, fiscal interest. 
uh, and once they move to uh, Belgium, then um, the, the contract will end in Nigeria and will start in Belgium or in Netherlands or wherever. Thank you um, for this clarification, Cedric. Um, Rob, maybe one more question for you. Are there any universal, universities or educational organization involved in this project or will be there uh, involvement of those kind of organizations? Yes, it's a, it's a good question. I'm not sure whether you refer to universities back in Africa or universities in the EU countries, so I'm not sure which one I can focus on. But for sure, we will be working with universities and educational organizations back in Africa, right, Cédric? So we will be looking into what profiles are we wanting to uh, identify, where can we find those, and then we will be going to campuses, you know, uh, education organizations, to post our vacancies, to engage, you know, with the youngsters there, etc. So that's definitely uh, something that we're going to do. Uh, I don't know, Cedric, if you want to add a word on that? No, absolutely, you're absolutely right, uh, Rob. Um, we are working in close partnership with uh, with universities in both Nigeria and Senegal, but also with uh, national uh, employment agencies as well, uh, with whom we will be communicating the, the jobs, the opportunities, and we will be training them sometimes in assessing the, the candidates. So it will be a, a joint work with uh, with them, with both. And um, we will um, advise as well the universities where we are facing shortage of skills and what skills are missing. So this is very important to have this communication between uh, the companies uh, that will receive the talents and the ones who are producing uh, these talents, who are educating these talents, who are training these talents. So there, this will be a direct communication, direct link to these uh, institutions. And then I might add also just one word on the engagement towards the Belgian uh, education and the university uh, organization. So in Belgium, indeed, we, we, we have established contacts with some uh, uh, organizations and we will invite them together with a number of other stakeholders, what we call the stakeholder meeting that will take place in Belgium in the second part of this year, so after summer. Uh, you will hear about that uh, and we will most probably also uh, disseminate you know the invitation to this network of participants in this webinar but definitely the universities and research uh, sector will be there and will also co-organize uh, with us that stakeholder meeting so that we can combine also the little bit more academic theoretical angle related to this kind of international mobility versus the very practical angle where today very much you know in the practical side uh, but of course, there's a lot of studies and research being done on these things, and it could be interesting to discuss those as well during that meeting. So, a lot of relevant organizations um, involved in this project, in this project uh, regarding smart economic demand driven migration, actually. Um, so, if there are any interest in the match project, please do not hesitate to contact us, one of the partners or uh, the partners. You um, will also have their coordinates. I think uh, also this webinar is um, yeah will be sent to all participants here. I don't see any questions anymore, but I think it's a quarter after three, uh, which would should be the end of this webinar. If there are any questions uh, popping up the next coming days or weeks, uh, so. To ask them um, with um, yeah, our contact information is also can be found on the website um, and also some more information, detailed information regarding the project. Um, I don't know if one of the uh, panelists. Uh, I think I can only um, end by thank you um, all very much for the information and the expertise. Um, maybe Rob uh, to have a, an ending word uh, for this webinar. Yes, thank you very much, Davy, for the very good time keeping and the excellent uh, moderation. So thanks a lot for that. Thanks to all participants. Uh, thanks for the interesting questions. Uh, and, and I know that this is a complicated topic, uh, and that once you start thinking about it, you know there's a lot of other questions that pop up. Uh, so don't hesitate coming back to us, uh, to VOCA, to Agoria, to IOM, to VDAB. Uh, we are there for you. Uh, if you have questions, if you want to double check things, uh, you know, you will find our contact information all over the place. So feel free to reach out. And if you're interested, you know, in following up on uh, the match project, please register on our website and we'll be in touch with you then shortly.
Thank you very much and have a nice afternoon, everyone. Yes. Thank you all. Thank you very much all. Bye-bye. Yes, bye.